the management of keratoconus. In this course, I will cover keratoconus and other ectetic corneal disorders. These will be categorized in four sections, comprising diagnosis, classifications, management modalities, and the new algorithm. In addition, at the end of the course, there will be some clinical cases that will be studied as examples. The importance of this course stems from the application of my step-by-step -step systematic academic methodology, in which basics will be presented in correlation with their clinical interpretation. This course is based on my book of the same title, Quick Guide to the Management of Keratoconus, that was published by the German publisher Springer. This course will be divided into parts, and these parts will be uploaded in sequence to iTube and YouTube. Kindly visit my page on Facebook, Facebook slash Sinjab.academy, in order to give me your valuable feedback, and I will be more than happy to answer any question. Good luck. Quick guide to the management of keratoconus. In this course, we will discuss diagnosis and classification, management modalities, the new algorithm and systematic approach, and we will study some clinical cases. Section 1. Diagnosis and classification. This comes in two parts. Part 1. Diagnostic tools. And part 2. Classifications. In this section, the audience will experience diagnostic tools, abnormal patterns and parameters of corneal tomography, and the classifications of ectetic disorders. Section 1, Part 1, Diagnostic Tools. In this part, we will describe clinical findings, corneal biomechanics, and corneal imaging. Clinical Findings. Clinical findings include external signs such as Munson's sign and Rizzotti's sign. The retinoscopic sign is one of the earliest signs that can be detected in early stages of keratoconus, especially on dilated refraction, where we can see the scissoring reflex. On slit lamp by microscopy, we may see the Fleischer's ring, which is the deposition of iron in the basement layer of the epithelium around the base of the cone. On slit lamp by microscopy, we may see the focal thinning, which is best seen on retroillumination. Focal thinning may be central, paracentral, or peripheral, such as in pellucid marginal degeneration. Voxestriae or stress lines are vertical lines that can be detected in advanced cases of keratoconus because of the stretching of decimates membrane under the intraocular forces because of very thin and weak cornea. We can see also hydrops cornea, anterior stromal scarring, or even full thickness scarring. The keratoscopy sign. The placido disc is used to detect the shape of the anterior surface of the cornea. The rings of the placido disc are projected onto the surface of the cornea, and the first Purkinje image of these rings reflects the shape of this surface. As we see in the image in the middle, the rings are concentric, central, and regular, reflecting a normal cornea. While in the image on the right, the cornea is distorted, the rings are crowded in some places and separated in other places, reflecting the anterior surface of a keratoconic cornea. The same principle is used in the photokeratoscope or the video keratoscope, but the difference is, in this machine, the computer transfers the information taken by the placido disk into color-coded maps, 
where the steep areas are color coded as hot spots with uh, hot colors, while the flat areas are color coded as cold colors. Section 1, Part 1 Diagnostic Tools Corneal Biomechanics. Before discussing corneal biomechanics in depth, let's have a look at the structure and infrastructure of the cornea. The cornea is composed of six layers the tear film, the epithelium, Bowman's membrane, the stroma, Desmet's membrane, and the endothelium. The thickness of the epithelium is about 50 microns. The thickness of Bowman's membrane is between 8 and 10 microns. The bulk of the cornea is composed of the stroma, which is about 500 microns. And finally, the thickness of Desmet's membrane with the endothelium is about 10 to 15 microns in adulthood. Let me ask a question. If we remove Bowman layer, just Bowman layer, what will happen to corneal biomechanics? We have three options or three answers. They are weakened significantly, they are unchanged, or they are weakened slightly. In fact, they are unchanged. Several studies support that this does not measurably alter corneal biomechanics because the main element that dominates corneal biomechanics is the stroma. Now let's see this picture. In the upper part, the uh, collagen fibers or collagen bundles are thicker than those in the lower part. Of course, the upper part represents the uh, normal uh, cornea, while the uh, lower part represents uh, a cornea with keratoconus. This leads us to the uh, structure of the stroma of the cornea. The anterior one-third of the cornea is composed of compact bundles of collagen fibers, uh, which are oriented obliquely, while the posterior two parts uh, uh, have uh, loose uh, bundles and uh, less connected to each other. So, which two statements are correct? The posterior is more rigid than the anterior. The periphery of the cornea is stiffer than the center. The center is stiffer than the periphery. Or the anterior is more rigid than the posterior. In fact, the periphery is stiffer than the center because the center of the cornea is composed of 300 layers of collagen bundles, while the peripheral part of the cornea is composed of 500 uh, bundles. At the same time, the anterior third uh, of uh, the stroma is more rigid than the posterior two-thirds because of uh, more compact uh, bundles uh, uh, which are uh, oriented uh, obliquely. In addition to this, there are some um, uh, interlamellar uh, uh, connections uh, between uh, the uh, uh, bundles of the collagen. Uh, so uh, we can say that uh, when the cornea has um, uh, bonds or uh, uh, numerous bonds between bundles of fibers and the fibers of uh, the collagen uh, are thicker, uh, then the cornea is stiffer and stronger than when it has less uh, bonds between fibers and the, the fibers are thinner. This is the case in keratoconus and ectatic corneal disorders, where the uh, bundles um, uh, are thinner and uh, the bonds are uh, fewer than uh, those in the normal cornea, uh, leading to a thinning of the cornea and uh, ectasia. After the corneal biomechanics concept uh, had appeared, uh, some uh, clinical manifestations could be understood and could be explained, such as myopic regression, hyperopic regression, post-operative irregularities, and iatrogenic ectasia. For example, in old profiles of myopic ablation, the laser beam was applied 
uh, to the central part of the cornea, to the very central part of the cornea, and the optical zone was about 5 to 5.5 millimeters. And the concept of transitional zone was not clear. Therefore, there was a sharp edge cut at the periphery of the optical zone, which forced the collagen fibers at the edges to shrink and bulge out, bulge in uh, into the uh, anterior chamber. And then, under the uh, intraocular forces, the central part of the cornea uh, bulged out in order, uh, and this will uh, reduce the uh, amount of myopic uh, correction. The same can be said in hyperopic ablation, especially when the um, uh, when correcting high degrees, more than plus four uh, diopters of uh, hyperopia. Um, in, in general. Um, the uh, hyperopic ablation um, uh, is done at the periphery of the cornea in order to force the central, of the, uh, th central part of the cornea to bulge out in order to compensate for uh, hyperopia. But when uh, the uh, ablation uh, depth was very high at the periphery, um, uh, these points uh, become weak and they are uh, prone to uh, the intraocular forces more than the central part, uh, which uh, forces the um, uh, center of the cornea to be flattened, uh, and this uh, by itself reduces the amount of hyperopic uh, correction, uh, which is called uh, hyperopic regression. In corneal irregularities, uh, when uh, there are some irregularities uh, preoperatively, it means that either the anterior surface or posterior surface or both uh, may have some irregularities and uh, when uh, the uh, cornea is treated uh, by uh, uh, photorefractive surgery, uh, there will be unequal forces uh, on the cornea uh, and this will lead by itself to post-operative uh, irregularities such as in this case. Now, before talking about the um, measurement tools of corneal biomechanics, we have to know something about elasticity and viscosity. Elasticity is the property of a substance that enables it to change its length, volume, or shape in direct response to a force, and to recover its original form upon the removal of that force. Viscosity is the resistance of a fluid, liquid, or gas to a change in shape or movement of neighboring portions relative to one another. The more viscous a fluid is, the more it resists flow. Elasticity is measured by Young's module. It is a stress-strain diagram, and the larger the number, the stiffer the cornea. With age, elasticity increases, which means that the cornea becomes stiffer. The estrogen has an adverse effect on the elasticity of the cornea. It reduces the elasticity and uh, uh, exposes the cornea to uh, keratoctasia uh, or, uh, of pro or progression of keratoconus. The cornea is viscoelastic. Its viscosity comes from the matrix which is uh, between the uh, collagen fibers and the elasticity comes from collagen fibers. So the more collagen fibers the cornea has, the more elastic it is, uh, and vice versa. Corneal biomechanics can be measured by ocular response analyzer, aura, curvis, or in laboratory by densitometry. I will talk about Aura. The Aura machine consists of a light source that emits uh, parallel uh, light rays of infrared and a light receptor and in between there is an air puff. This machine is directed towards the uh, measured cornea. In uh, the primary position the cornea is in its uh, uh, normal uh, position, where it is convex, and the uh, uh, 
reflected lights coming from the uh, light source, they are reflected by the cornea uh, in a divergent path. Now, an air puff is given. The cornea starts to uh, go inwards. When it reaches uh, the flat position, then the reflected lights will be also parallel, giving a peak of light uh, which uh, composes the first peak of the waveform uh, plotted by the aura. Now, the cornea, of course, continues to go inward and it takes a convex shape, which means that the reflected rays will be uh, reflected in a divergence path again, uh, and the intensity of uh, the light uh, measured by the receptor uh, will, be, uh, will fall down. Then the cornea starts to recover its uh, uh, primary shape and it goes back to the flat position uh, and the uh, reflected light rays will be reflected in parallel uh, uh, path again, uh, giving an, uh, a maximum intensity and uh, drawing the uh, second peak of uh, the uh, uh, aura waveform. Uh, when the cornea reaches uh, the uh, 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 convex uh, primary position, um, the rays uh, also will be emitted uh, or reflected um, uh, in a divergent path and the intensity will fall down again. The, uh, this, sig this signal is plotted um, as we see here in the picture. Um, uh, we have two uh, curves. The green curve uh, presents the uh, uh, changes of pressure uh, under the air puff and the uh, red curve uh, presents the changes uh, of light intensity during uh, this measurement. The uh, intersection between the uh, green curve and the first peak uh, or the in signal peak uh, of this waveform uh, is called aplanation pressure one and the intersection between the green curve and the out signal peak or the second signal peak is called aplanation pressure two. The difference between these two levels uh, is known as corneal hysteresis. In addition, there is another factor which is called the corneal resistance factor. Now, the corneal hysteresis measures the viscosity of the cornea, while the corneal resistance factor measures the elasticity of the cornea. Corneal hysteresis has been studied in normal eyes, keratoconic eyes, and uh, eyes with uh, uh, diseased thick, uh, thickened corneas, such as Fox and cornea guttata. As we see in the distribution of the bars here, uh, whenever the corneal hysteresis number is below 8, it is absolutely abnormal. When it is above 13, it is absolutely normal. But, but when it is between 8 and 13, it is suspicious. The other thing that uh, we should see here also uh, is uh, the uh, diseased thick cornea, uh, corneas behave as bad as uh, keratoconic uh, corneas or thin corneas. And this is uh, because of um, the high ratio of the matrix um, uh, and the viscosity of the cornea uh, in relation to uh, the uh, elasticity of collagen fibers. Now back to the waveform. This is the waveform of a normal eye. Compare it with uh, a waveform of a keratoconus eye. If you see after the second uh, uh, red peak, there is a flutter. This fluctuation uh, means that the cornea, uh, when it, uh, starts to, uh, it starts to recover its uh, primary shape, uh, it takes a fluttering uh, movement because it is weak and thin. This is a hallmark of uh, ectetic corneal disorders, even in very early uh, stages and even in form frost keratoconus. And this sign should be used as a screening test uh, for uh, all patients um, uh, coming for uh, photorefractive surgeries because uh, it may diagnose form frost keratoconus. In fact, there are uh, 38 parameters derived uh, from this machine. 
all together are used in order to build the keratoconus match index, the KMI, uh, and to give a percentage of normality uh, in the measured eye. Look at this case. This is a normal eye, uh, and look at the green bar. Compare it with uh, this eye, which is suspected. Uh, you see the percentage of normality is low, and uh, suspicion is high. Uh, this is a keratoconus eye. Uh, before applying uh, uh, cross-linking, and this is after applying uh, cross-linking, it became uh, a bit stiffer. One of the measurement tools also is Corvus. The Corvus um, uh, is a machine uh, by Oculus, and uh, it contains uh, an ultra-speed uh, uh, video camera uh, that records the movement of the cornea under the uh, pressure uh, of the air puff. And uh, many parameters are derived from this, but uh, this machine is still under investigation and there are uh, no cutoff points uh, yet. This is the end of this video. In the next video, we will start talking about corneal imaging.